Before talking about biology, we need to understand the rules of learning any science. What is the purpose of science? To learn about the world. And the universe? To become a science teacher. You're right, but the purpose of science is to discover. And how do you discover? Experimentation. Experiments allow you to learn. Let me show you what I mean. See this? This is not an experiment, but I'll make it one. Watch. An experiment requires an independent variable, constants, and a dependent variable. The independent variable is the variable you change on purpose the if part of the hypothesis. Constants are conditions that must stay the same, and dependent variables are things that respond to the independent variable. They're the then part of the hypothesis. You can model this on an IVCDV chart. In the experiment I'm about to do, the independent variable is the amount of baking soda measured in teaspoons. The constants are the location, amount of vinegar, and the container. And the dependent variable is the height the solution will gain, measured in centimeters. My hypothesis is that if the amount of baking soda is increased, then the height the solution gains will also increase. Always organize data into data tables and graphs. With this, I can predict that at 5 teaspoons, the height will be 10 centimeters because as the amount of baking soda increases, the height approaches a limit of 10. What's so important about experimental design? Experimental design is the way we learn, but it's also how we discover new things. And this is the reason we as society and as individuals can advance. You use experimental design in real life subconsciously. Pretend I'm talking to person X who's right here. I associate subconsciously the independent variable of the angle of my head to the length person X looks at me, which is a signal of paying attention, which is the dependent variable. I'm looking this way, and the person only looks at me for five seconds. He's only paying attention for five seconds. I subconsciously adjust the independent variable to find the optimum dependent variable. So I look this way. I just got a 100 on the test, but if you don't know why, let me explain why I chose B for question 3. You see, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids are the four most essential molecules that your cells need to properly function. Carbohydrates are the primary energy source. Examples are sugars and starches. These molecules of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen take a five carbon ring shape. The monomer is called a monosaccharide and the polymer is a polysaccharide. A protein is a structural component that makes up the body. There are strings of amino acids connected with peptide bonds. And these bonds determine the shape of the protein by determining the way it folds. Lipids are oils, waxes, or fats that store long-term energy, act as hormones and steroids, and also make a part of the cell membrane. The structure of a lipid looks like a capital E, with a vertical glycerol backbone and three fatty acids extending out. Let's look at the diagram. As you can see, saturated fats have the maximum number of hydrogen to carbon bonds. Unsaturated fats have the C to C double bond, and only one of them, while polyunsaturated fats have multiple C to C double bonds.
Nucleic acids store genetic information and help make proteins. There are two types, DNA and RNA, and there are some differences. So, the monomers of nucleic acids are nucleotides. A nucleotide is made up of a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogen base. Remember, in DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose, and the nitrogen bases are A, T, C, and G. But in RNA, the sugar is ribose, and the nitrogen bases are A, U, C, and G. When I handed the test in to the teacher, she asked me why it was so important to understand these organic molecules. So I said, raise your left hand, and she did. And I said, where did you get the energy to raise your hand? She didn't respond, so I said carbohydrates. And then I asked her, do you know how you digested polysaccharides to use that energy? She didn't respond, so I said enzymes, proteins. So then I asked her how she got those proteins. She didn't answer, so I said nucleic acids, DNA. And then she got so angry, she slapped her hand on the table, and I said, why didn't all your cells leak out the organelles onto the table? She didn't respond, and I said, because you have lipids in your cell membranes. There are eight characteristics of life. Cell composition. Reproduction. Universal genetic code. Growth. Metabolism, response to stimuli, homeostasis, and change over time. Dude, like why do you even care about this stuff? Well, that's a good question. This is actually a very important thing. Since I meet all eight of these conditions, I am a living thing. I don't know if you are, but I am. And that's a big deal. Now I know that a cell is living, but that's too vague. You're right, yes it is vague, so that's why I classify them into prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Bacteria and archaebacteria are prokaryotic, while animal, plant, fungi, and protist cells are eukaryotic. The main difference is that prokaryotes have no membrane-bound organelles. However, both have ribosomes, a cytoplasm, and a cell membrane. In terms of cell homeostasis, there are three types of solutions. Isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. Let's see the difference. Assume this is a cell with 50% water. If this is a solution of 50% water, then it is isotonic compared to this cell. If the cell is in the liquid, then the 50% water in and out of the cell will flow freely as there still is movement, but it will not contribute to any size change to this cell. Therefore, it is isotonic. And now let's say this is 50% water and this is 100% water. 100% water will flow into the semi-permeable membrane and this is a hypotonic solution because the size of the cell increased. 30% water, 50% water. The cell size shrinks as the water flows through the semi-permeable membrane into the solution. It is hypertonic. Here you can see a red blood cell put in these three different solutions. That was passive transport. The cell didn't use energy. Water flows from high to low concentration with the concentration gradient. In active transport, the cell does use energy, and molecules move from low to high concentration against the concentration gradient. In exocytosis, the cell releases molecules. Endocytosis is when the cell takes in molecules. There are two types. Phagocytosis, when the cell eats, and penocytosis when the cell drinks. You should all be wondering how this relates to me and you. And the question you should be asking is, if individual cells can't maintain homeostasis, then can the whole body maintain homeostasis? And the answer is no. And this is why it's so important. See, all of our cells are related to cell homeostasis, since they can maintain homeostasis, then our whole bodies can. That was cell homeostasis, but now let's talk about mitosis. The cell cycle has many stages, I'll walk you through. 
These are the stages of the cell cycle. G1, S, and G2 are part of interphase. In G1, the DNA is loose, and the cell undergoes normal functions and then replicates its organelles. In S, DNA replication occurs. In G2, the cell continues to grow to prepare for mitosis. Remember PMAT in mitosis. P stands for prophase, when the chromosomes form and the nuclear envelope disintegrates. Centrioles move to opposite sides and spindle fibers form. M stands for metaphase. Spindle fibers attach the chromosomes at the equator of the cell. A stands for anaphase. The chromatids separate. And T is telophase. When the spindle fibers fall apart, a nuclear envelope forms and the chromosomes uncoil. Cytokinesis is another stage that some people consider to be part of mitosis. In this stage, cytoplasm divides and the cell enters interphase once again. This diagram sums it up quite nicely. Do you think I even care? Yes, I do think you care. For one, mitosis repairs damaged tissues. And two, mitosis is responsible for your growth and my growth. You see, when I was a zygote, I was one cell. And then it divided. With mitosis, it became two, and then four, and eight, and sixteen. If you care enough to ask me that question, be thankful that I'm here because of mitosis. The first step of protein synthesis is transcription. It's when mRNA is made from a DNA blueprint. First, helicase unzips the DNA, and then RNA polymerase takes the nucleotides to form the mRNA strand, which would be AUG. T bonds to A, A bonds to U because it's RNA, and C bonds to G. This is the mRNA strand. And then the DNA gets zipped up by ligase. The mRNA then leaves the nucleus and enters the ribosomes in the cytoplasm. And now we leave the nucleus and approach a ribosome. The mRNA codon, a sequence of three bases, is read by the tRNA, which fetches the anticodon, A to U, U to A, G to C, UAC, and the appropriate amino acid, which is methionine, or start. Peptide bonds link the amino acids and a protein is formed. Why am I grateful for proteins? One, my hair has structure. Proteins. Two, I digested a cherry. Enzymes are proteins. Three, my breathing is useful because hemoglobin actually carries the oxygen to my cells. There are proteins. And what made them proteins? Transcription and translation. Here you see the second part of protein synthesis, translation, in which the tRNA brings back amino acids to the ribosome to form proteins. Meiosis is a gamete creation process that creates four haploid daughter cells from one diploid cell. There are eight stages in meiosis that are separated into meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Just to get things straight, a chromosome refers to a set of two DNA molecules in an X shape, with each side of the X being one sister chromatid. The second sister chromatid is created during the S phase of interphase. There's one difference between prophase and mitosis and prophase 1 and meiosis. In prophase 1 of meiosis, each duplicated chromosome bonds with the other similar duplicated chromosome from the other parent. These two chromosome pairs are called homologous chromosomes. In metaphase 1 of meiosis, the homologous chromosome pairs line up at the cell equator and spindle fibers attach to the centromeres. This is a duplicated chromosome from the father, and this is the homologous chromosome from the mother. When they line up at the cell equator, there are two different orientations for this pair. Like this, or like this. And because there are 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes, there are 2 to the 23rd power orientations, or 8,388,608 different orientations. This contributes to genetic diversity. Anaphase 1 and telophase 1 conclude the cell division. Now there are two cells, each with half the genetic information of a usual somatic cell. Each cell contains 23 different duplicated chromosomes and 46 different chromatids. 
In meiosis II, the same four stages are repeated, except this time the sister chromatids are separated. This creates four cells, each having 23 chromatids. However, in prophase I, crossing over occurs. Part of a chromatid from one chromosome and part of a chromatid from the homologous chromosome cross over and exchange, creating even more genetic variation. Why is meiosis so important? Well, this is the reason we have genetic variation, and this is important to me. I mean, look at my brother. He's different from me, even though we have the same parents. Hello, I'm genetically different from my brother. In this diagram of meiosis, you can see how in metaphase 1, the orange chromosome is on the bottom. Well, actually, this orientation is totally random and is a contributor to genetic variation. Another thing to notice is that in prophase 1, the red chromosome and the orange homologous chromosome are crossing over, and this is another factor of genetic variation that we all should be thankful for. Different copies of the same gene that arise from mutation are called alleles. Dominant alleles are ones that only require one copy of itself to be expressed in the offspring, while recessive alleles require two copies of itself to be expressed. When we're talking about inheritance, we're talking about what types of alleles you are getting from your mother and father. We can model inheritance with Punnett squares, but first, let's understand genotype and phenotype. Genotype is the actual genetic information of an organism, while phenotype is whether it expresses dominant or recessive. In a certain cat breed, Gray fur, or capital G, is dominant to white fur, the recessive, or lowercase g. This is the genotype of the mother, capital G, lowercase g. The phenotype is gray fur because since there is one dominant allele, it is expressed. The same occurs with the father. If the two alleles are different, it is said that the organism has a heterozygous genotype. The Punnett square shows the possible offspring genotypes and phenotypes of these two cats with heterozygous genotypes. Capital G, capital G. This is homozygous dominant. Homozygous meaning having two of the same allele. Capital G, lowercase g is heterozygous, expressing gray fur. Lowercase g, capital G is also heterozygous for gray fur. And now, since there are two copies of lowercase g, the recessive trait, white, only 25%, or this one cat here, has white fur and is homozygous recessive. Let's talk about genotypic and phenotypic ratio. Genotypic ratio is the ratio of the number of homozygous dominant to heterozygous to homozygous recessive, which is 1 to 2 to 1. Phenotypic ratio is the same, except it's for the phenotype, which is the number of dominant expressing offspring to the number of recessive expressing offspring, which is 3 to 1. How does this even apply to me? I'll give you an example. In blood type, there's this thing called codominance. Codominance is when two alleles are neither dominant nor excessive. When they're put together, both are expressed. In capital I, A, capital I, B, or AB blood, both the A and the B are expressed. This is my genotype. Small I, small I, recessive, homozygous for type O blood. I know my dad's also O, so he must have this genotype. Since I'm O, I inherited one little I from my mother, but I know my mother's type B, so the problem is, what's my mother's genotype? Easy. Capital I, superscript B. Evolution is a process by which descendants become biologically different from their ancestors. Natural selection is the mechanism of evolution. It is the process by which organisms with beneficial adaptations survive and reproduce. In this demonstration, we'll identify the four principles of natural selection and see how evolution occurs with it. The first principle is overproduction. Having an abundance of offspring guarantees competition. In this overly simple demonstration, 
These cats are fighting for food. The second principle is variation of genetics. These cats are genetically different thanks to meiosis and mutations. The third principle is adaptation. Organisms with better adaptations adapt to their environment and help them survive to reproduce. It's the concept of survival of the fittest. In terms of camouflage, this cat is the best suited to environment and this is second best suited to the environment. A predator comes, it is most likely to feed on the prey, the cats that are most obviously seen in the environment. The fourth principle is descent with modification. These two cats will survive and reproduce, and their offspring will most likely be orange and brown. These colors are more suited to the environment. As you can see, this generation of cats has descended with modification from their ancestors. Evolution. I don't get it. If we individuals can't change form, how is natural selection and evolution important? I'm glad you brought that up. Organism transformation, as in Pokemon, isn't real. Evolution occurs at the population level, and at the human population level, intelligence and health are the two factors that determine whether or not you're going to grow up and reproduce. And we should all be grateful that this relates to all of us. We are descendants with these amazing beneficial adaptations. In the diagram here, you can see that before selection, the red organisms were the best suited to their environments. So over time, you can see how the species evolved with a beneficial adaptation. The lytic cycle and lysogenic cycles are the ways a virus can reproduce. In the lytic cycle, the virus enters a cell and immediately it uses its own DNA to reproduce and assemble the parts of new viruses whereupon they break out and destroy or lyse the cell to affect new cells. In the lysogenic cycle, it's different because the virus attaches its own DNA with the DNA of the cell and uses that to reproduce and uses that method to lyse the cell later and infect new cells. This diagram shows the relationship between the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. When a virus injects its genetic material into a cell, it can use that time to manufacture new virus parts or attach the genetic material to the cell's genetic material. If the virus contains RNA, it will change the RNA into DNA before attaching it to the cell's DNA. Hello, I am a cell. Hello, I'm a virus and this is my antigen. <laughs> I'm infected! <laughs> Hello, I'm a macrophage! Ooh, another virus! Mmm, <laughs> and now I shall present its antigen. Hello, I'm a helper T-cell. Look, an antigen! Plasma B and killer T-cells, the battle has begun! I'm infected. Please kill me so the virus can't reproduce. Okie dokie. Oh. Hello, I'm a plasma B cell. I make antibodies to defeat viruses. Oh look, a virus. Ha ha. Hello, I'm a suppressor T cell. It looks like all the viruses are defeated. The war is over. You can leave now. Hello, I'm a memory B cell. Safety patrol on duty. I will now patrol the area to make sure the virus doesn't come again. I've memorized the antigen, and when I see it again, our secondary response will be way faster. Now you've seen all the cells in the process of immune response. It's not like a big war or something. How is this even related to you? The important thing is that everything I just told you actually occurs within my body. And here's the thing, when I have viruses in my body, I don't feel sick. 
because of a faster secondary response, and that is a big deal. It's related to me a lot. Taxonomy is just naming things, right? Well, let's start off by classifying this. What's this called, hmm? Hey, genius! FYI, it's called a wolf. Be more specific. It's a gray wolf. No, it's a timber wolf. You can't say it's a timber wolf, but you can say it's a western wolf, hmm? Hey, stop arguing. I know the real name. The official scientific binomial name is Canis lupus, where Canis is the genus and lupus is the species. Wow, I totally forgot about that. Thanks for reminding me. Scientific name, or binomial name, is composed of two words. The first being the genus, and the second being the species. Just to clarify, here's the classification of organisms from the largest group to the smallest group. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. There are six kingdoms. Archaebacteria, bacteria, protista, fungi, planta, and animalia. Well, if you're so awesome, why don't you classify yourself? Okay, I'll classify myself. I am Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Chordata, Class Mammalia, Order Primates, Family Hominidae, Genus Homo, and Species Sapiens. Homo Sapiens. An important thing to point out is that as I progress from kingdom or domain to species, the number of species in each category gets fewer and fewer, and the categories get more and more specific. For example, in the phylum chordata here, there are many species, but there is only one species in the species Ursus americanus, the American black bear. Photosynthesis is how plants get energy. It's the process by which plants use light energy to get chemical energy. The first step of photosynthesis is light reaction. This occurs in the grana, or stacks of thylakoids in the chloroplasts of plants. Chlorophyll is a substance found in the chloroplasts. First, chlorophyll uses light energy to break apart water, H2O, into H2 and O. Oh look, here's another O. The O's combine, and the oxygen gas leaves the plant. The next step is dark reaction, or the Calvin cycle. Contrary to the light reaction, the Calvin cycle does not require light. It occurs in the stroma, or liquid, of the chloroplasts. Hey look, it's carbon dioxide, CO2. H2 bonds to O, water is a waste product. And look, here's another H2. It bonds with C and O to form CH2O, which is a simple substance. Multiply this by 6, and you have C6H12O6, or glucose, the plant's primary energy source. Plants, like animals, have hormones. Gibberellins cause rapid growth and end seed dormancy. Just yesterday, this plant was this tall. Today, it's this tall. That's a growth of 10 centimeters. Ethylene is produced in fruit or ripened ovaries and causes ripening. Cytokinins cause lateral growth and slow the aging process. Auxins elongate the apical meristem, or the growing tip of a stem. Auxins have a tendency to gather on the side of a plant that is shaded. I had a light over here, therefore the auxins build up on this side of the apical meristem, causing the plant to grow this way, toward the light. The tendency of a plant to grow toward a light because of auxins is called Phototropism. Here, red is the intensity of auxin concentration. When the light is from above, auxin concentration is fairly even on both sides of the apical meristem. But when the light comes from one side, auxin concentrates on the side of the plant that is darker, lengthening the apical meristem there and bending the plant toward the light. You're always talking about how everything's related to you. Well, guess what? You're not even a plant. So what are you going to do this time? I'm going to say that, for one, I need plants to survive. I am an omnivore, which means I eat animals and plants. And for these plants to grow large enough for me to eat and survive by themselves, 
They need photosynthesis and hormone regulation in order for me to survive. And another similarity between me and the plant is that we both use carbohydrates as the main energy source and have the sun as the ultimate energy source. Cellular respiration is when a cell uses glucose to produce ATP, the molecule of energy. In aerobic respiration, oxygen is needed, but in anaerobic respiration, which includes lactic acid and alcohol fermentation, oxygen is not needed. Biochemical cycles are the cycles of natural, non-living substances through the ecosystem. The water cycle is a biochemical cycle. And so is the nitrogen cycle. And the carbon cycle. Decomposers and nitrogen-fixing bacteria that live in the soil can ammonify atmospheric nitrogen, or N2, into ammonium. Nitrifying bacteria convert that into nitrites and then nitrates, which plants can assimilate or take in through the roots. Denitrifying bacteria convert nitrates back into atmospheric nitrogen, N2. Although biochemical cycles are abiotic, they are necessary for life. Interrelationship is the relationship between organisms, along with the three types of symbiosis, there are five types of interrelationship. Predation, where one organism feeds upon the other. <laughs> Competition, when organisms are looking for the same resource. Symbiosis type 1, parasitism, when one organism is harmed and the other benefits. <laughs> Symbiosis type 2, commensalism, where one organism benefits and the other is neither helped nor harmed. Ha <laughs> ha! And symbiosis type 3, mutualism, where both organisms benefit. I'm searching for food. Hmm, here, use my binoculars. I'll show you some of my food. Okay. But I thought we're humans! Exactly! Humans have interrelationships too. Between humans, there's much competition. And between human and pet, for instance, you can have a mutualism where the human can tell the pet to fetch slippers, for example, and the pet gets basic needs. Alas! I am banished! Oh, my hand! What organ system did I just show you? The integumentary system? Well, obviously, the wound was on the skin, but what else is it? Perhaps. The circulatory system, the platelets in the blood, because of a positive feedback loop, increase the amount of platelets to this area on the hand wound. Now what about nervous system? The man that just fell on the floor had a nervous system that detected the pain. What about endocrine system? The man secreted adrenaline from the adrenal glands to ease his pain. You see how all of these systems are related? Well, this is called organ system interdependence. There are two types of feedback loops that regulate homeostasis, which is the stable internal environment. I already talked about positive feedback loops, which require a special condition, but negative feedback loops are the ones I really want to focus on. A negative feedback loop is a system of response to external stimuli that allows the body to maintain ideal conditions. It can be regulated by the nervous system, endocrine system, or even both. In blood sugar regulation, homeostasis is specifically defined as 90 mg of glucose per 100 ml of blood. When your blood glucose level is low, yes, that is a stimulus, your pancreas releases glucagon and your liver releases glucose from glycogen. But when it's high, another stimulus, your pancreas releases insulin and your cells and liver take up more glucose. Right now you're seeing this on the screen, but guess what? Homeostasis and this specific negative feedback loop is occurring within your body and my body right now. Yes, in your body right now. Isn't that amazing? If you'd like to see this video again, go to my channel, Chou Ji Da Ge, spelled 
Capital C, lowercase h a o j i b a g e. 超级大哥 Have a nice day.